whether you are in business or not, load shedding and unscheduled power outages affect us all. In this conversation, the CEO of Babcock Ndutuko Engineering, Deva Govinda, tells us how OEMs can help reduce and even eliminate load shedding. He also lets us in on how innovative solutions can help lead to a more just power transition. We talk about how power utilities and OEMs can work together to improve sustainability and how the power mix of the future looks like. Stay tuned for cutting edge insights on how Babcock's OEM offering is changing the electrical power industry. Deva, thank you so much for making the time to talk to us about OEMs uh, this afternoon. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's going to be a great conversation, I'm pretty sure. There's a lot to learn. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Mongezi. Thanks for the opportunity. You speak a lot in a lot of detail across many leading platforms about OEMs and their potential in reducing and possibly ending load shedding. So just to start us off, can you tell us who OEMs are and what they do? Okay, so um, OEMs, are it's an acronym that stands for Original Equipment Manufacturers. It's basically, if you take the power industry and you take the electrical power industry, it's the people that basically built the boilers, the turbines, and the generators. So mm -hmm. they are the ones that have been contracted to design a boiler, a turbine, or a generator. They have all the drawings, they have the construction drawings, and they're basically responsible for building it. So but it's basically someone that has the know-how, the intellectual property to build these very complex issues. And basically they are like the backup for the potential client if there are problems. Then they go back, they also, back to these OEMs, they are also there to ensure if there are problems and uh, they resolve this. They are also responsible sometimes for the maintenance, but they're also responsible for enhancing their technology they, they may have built. Like for 10 years ago, they built something, technology moves on, then they bring an advancement to whatever they have built to the table. Right. Now, just to delve a little bit deeper into this, um, OEMs are also said in very many spaces to be the solution in reducing and even eliminating load shedding or unscheduled power outages. How would they help with this? So when, when OEMs build plants, they build it according to a certain design and a criteria and to a certain level of performance. So what's happened now in the power industry is obviously that equipment now has deteriorated to various uh, for various reasons. And what OEMs can bring to the table is they will help the clients to bring back those uh, equipment back to the original state that they were built and designed for. Now, they're the only ones that can do that because they have the design criteria. They have models that can put in uh, into these models to say what has changed. For example, in a power industry, the coal quality may have changed. So when you built it, you had a certain coal quality, which is very good. Now yeah. you have a coal quality that is deteriorated. So the OEMs will be able to plug this in their models and say, well, we can do this with the present coal quality you've got and try to get it back to the original specifications. By doing this, they actually increase the efficiency, they increase the output, and ultimately, for over a long term of period, they actually save the customers and clients financially. From, from what I'm getting, I get the sense that OEMs are also, also follow the latest trends and understanding of the technology behind um, these, these plants as well. Would that be, would that be a correct assessment? Yes, no, absolutely correct. So we monitor, we track, we see what is a, what's in the latest developments. Uh, obviously, like with a company like uh, we, we are part of the Babcock International Group. So, for example, one of the big things that we pick up from our parent company is the issue of like welding. Even though our, co our company builds frigates and maintains submarines, welding is a critical component of that. And welding is a critical component for, boil for boilers, which we are an OEM. So those are the typical things we pick up where things can be done much better, much quicker. Um, but the big, the big issue as well is that we also have strategic alliances with a lot of technology providers that bring the latest technologies uh, to us and by, by virtue of the partnership we have with them, the strategic alliance, and we work together with them 
to enhance the plant of our customers. Now, you mentioned that you know OEMs have the drawings, they have the technical specifications, and they have um, they have the, the the understanding and the knowledge, and that they they would have been involved in building um, some of these plants or creating some of these plants that exist out there. Um, in addition to all of those, can you talk us through what some technical expertise OEMs bring into the marketplace? Now that's that's a very interesting question because a lot of people actually don't understand what the role of an OEM is. They think that, you know, you can get any other contractor that has worked on boilers and ask them to come and maintain your plant. Unfortunately, it doesn't work like that because when you have problems on your plant, the OEMs have, first of all, the technical ex excellence, they have the technical experience, they have the know-how, plus they have the skills. We have engineers that have been trained, that have uh, to help design some of the plants that have helped maintain it. So when OEMs actually come to the plant, they bring a one-stop service to the client from maintenance to enhancing the technology. And it's something that other companies that have, uh, have been working on boilers do not have. They do not have the insight, uh, unfortunately. Uh, they, have may, they may have a, a good idea of how the plant operates, but to try to get it back to its original state, that is something, unfortunately, that can only be done by OEMs. And very few companies realize that. And I think we'll touch on a bit later why there's a reluctance to, to engage OEMs. Mm, so yeah. that's one aspect. The other aspect is that um, there's a lot of investment that the OEMs make in terms of maintaining the skills that we have, and like you mentioned earlier on, keeping up to date with technology, mm. uh, anything that, that comes about that we bring, we always want to enhance the plant and obviously reduce the customer's cost at the end of the day. But the, it's like a long-term partnership. With an OEM, you will not see things and do not expect to see things change immediately. It happens over a long period. And the, the, obviously, the return on investment obviously will come back to the client, but over a long period, it's like a partnership. It's like a marriage. At the end of the yes, day. yes. I think... Along the lines of this, you know, this partnership that you talk about, something else that that is a thread that I that I seem to get from what you're saying is the the independence of OEMs. How important is this independence of OEMs uh, operating the way that they operate, and sometimes working with both the public and the private sector? Because I get it, I get this sense that sometimes the independence makes makes OEMs who they are and it kind of helps them to help their clients better because you get all this information, you get all of this insights. And if, you know, if, if a client engaged you two years ago, two years later, your application and systems would have improved. Does this, does this contribute at all? This independence contribute at all to how effective these partnerships become? Right. I think that's, that's one of the big things that, uh, you know, especially the public sector, obviously, the, uh, if you look at the public sector and you look like uh, some of the utilities we work for, they're obviously all cash constrained. They don't have the money to actually and the funding to actually uh, contract with OEMs. And I think that's where the trick is being missed in the, because we, we do a lot of assessments. We term what we do LIFEX studies. Like after 10 years when the plant is built, we actually do a life extension study to say if you want to extend your life of your plant beyond 10 years, this is the state of the plant that we find it in now. This is how you can bring it back to its original uh, state uh, state of uh, when it was built. And I think the fact that we are independent and uh, we can actually come and tell you exactly what is the state of your plant from a, a knowledge base, which very few sub other suppliers can do that. That's why it make, makes it important to engage with OEMs. I think this independence also sometimes uh, works uh, as a drawback against us because the issue is that um, sometimes OEMs there's an expectation that we you know we need to develop and and, and work with smaller contractors and develop uh, QSEs and SMEs. We've got no problem with that. I think that's one of the big issues that may be misunderstood. We actually by being independent we also develop other suppliers, and mm -hmm. I think that's where we're also trying to say that we. We have a training facility, for example, in Babcock, where we train artisans, we train mechanics, we train welders, so we can work with these smaller enterprises. I think there's a 
there's a role for all these suppliers in the whole chain that we can all work together. But unfortunately, the expertise resides with the OEM. And I think this is a message that we were trying to get through across in that webinar as well, is to say, um, if, if you contract directly with the OEM, you will receive a, uh, a component that you know is backed up by the intellectual know-how, by the drawings, by the engineering expertise, and the guarantee. Right. Because we will not disappear. We are there. If there's a problem, we are professional, we live by the guarantee, and we will rectify those issues. Even sometimes, if it's to our own detriment where there's an issue that we may have uh, incorrectly done, then we will correct that. One of the key challenges facing the power utility, you mentioned power utilities now, and I, and I, and I want us to get a little bit more into that. And one of the things that, that plagues them is implementation, or at least implementing innovative solutions or different solutions or new solutions that are coming into the marketplace. How do OEMs bring this much needed innovation while ensuring that implementation is also prioritized? It is one of the biggest problems we said that one of the things we see in the power industry is that um, the, the stations for some reason, probably a cost factor, but also maybe an engineering side of it. They, when they see something that has failed and they know it's failed, they, they go out on tender and they actually want like-for-like -like replacement. Mm -hmm. And that's where we find a, a big battle with, with the, the power utilities. And we are saying, yes, that may have worked 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago. Uh, there's technological advancements. We can offer you a more robust uh, product that will actually help solve your problems and be more sustainable in the future. But because of the... I would call it the red tape that the engineers have to go to change a design in a power station with something new. They resort back to a comfort position that says, we'll just replace like for like. And that's mm. where things are, are going wrong because if you replace like for like, you'll end up with the same problems in five years' time. And that's the challenges we're sitting with. I think there's a reluctance to, to accept innovative uh, products. There's a reluctance to, to accept some new ideas. But... You must always remember when we offer that, it's, it's in a risk partnership. There's a there's a win-win as well as a win-lose sure. situation. If it doesn't work, then we are ultimately accountable. And all we're trying to say is we want to engage with the, the power utility to say, well, sometimes we do stuff at our own cost. And we say we will fund this, but just give us a chance to demonstrate it to you. I think that's mm -hmm. one of the battles we sit with. A proof of concept of some sort. Yeah, proof of concept. <laughs> Now, one of the things that that some industries tend to be reluctant with in terms of innovative solutions and ideas is this, you, you mentioned guarantees. So it's this idea of being dependent on a service provider after an innovative solution has been implemented. How do you, how do you help your clients in, in, who are reluctant in that way to implement different new or innovative kind of cutting edge solutions while not being dependent on the supplier. You know, sometimes there is this, this kind of situation where, where businesses or businesses or industries feel as though, yes, I can take on this absolute, this new and really great solution, but how do I train my people, train my staff and maintain the credibility of the, you know, the industry or at least my organization without depending on the supplier. How do you work around those kinds of dynamics? That's an interesting question and I can answer it from a backdrop context. Sure. Um, how we position that is we have had a long, long history in this country, in South Africa. We've been in this country for over 130 years. Mm -hmm. So it is not like something like where we implement something and we just disappear and we're not there anymore. So yes. it's our, our history in this country. It's our commitment. It's our professionalism. It's the skills that we offer. And also the fact is that when new technologies come out, sometimes we invest in that as well. And we're saying, you know, like I mentioned earlier on, give us an opportunity to apply. Let us demonstrate, uh, like you use the word proof of concept, and show you mm. that it actually works. Um, yes. But what we try to do is we always try to make sure that we actually uh, – try to bring other people into the equation as well so that the client is not entirely beholden to us. There's always an option to do that. But one of the things we are saying is if we implement something and you decide that you want to maintain it in a different way, 
Yes. Do not completely leave us out. You can bring us mm-hmm. in. We can work yeah. with partnership with a, an emerging uh, 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 SME or a, a small medium enterprise business. We've got no problem with that because those small businesses need to be developed, but you yes. need the know-how, you need the engineering expertise. So that's what we're trying to 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 convince uh, the clients with and saying, yes, you don't have to put your, all your eggs in one basket. Yes, mm-hmm. you, you can work with us, but you have options where you can bring other role players in as well. You you spoke a bit earlier about how some plants or at least some solutions may have been created 10 years ago and clients want like for like solutions now. And one of the things that we talk about a lot now, of course, is sustainability. How do OEMs contribute to the kind of decarbonized power utility of the future that is needed for both the country, the world, and of course, environmental sustainability as a whole? So the first part about that is that, and maybe this won't go down well, but uh... Let me just say this, because I've been consistently saying this before, is that unfortunately, if you take a country like South Africa, a lot of people say we're going to transition away from coal. Yes, we will transition away from coal, but uh, I, uh, I've i said this before. I believe that by the year 2070, and a lot of people ask me to make sure I'm saying the correct year, so it's 2070, that's 2070, you will still find coal power stations operating in South Africa. Okay. So you'll see the likes of Madupi and Kusile still running. It's because we have an abundance of coal in this country. And Mm -hmm. uh, I've been on both sides. I was also the acting head of sustainability in a previous organization I I worked in. And I think it's a reality that you have to to realize that if for a country like South Africa, you can't have one source of energy that's going to drive the economy of this country. There's a role and a place for all different types of energy. So there's a place for coal, there's a place for gas, there's a place for nuclear, there's a place for renewables. It is a mixture. So Mm -hmm. in terms of energy security as well, you would need that diverse mixture. So that's the background. But in terms of how OEMs help in terms of sustainability and in terms of uh, ensuring a a, a reduction, decarbonization, one of the things we do as well is that if we optimize a coal-fired power plant, we can actually optimize it in such a way that we improve the efficiency so that you actually use less coal but generate more of the megawatts. So that's the first thing. That's what we are. That's one of our, what we term, bread and butter issues. Those are the Before you carry on from there, is that a yeah. function of, techno- of, of, of newer technology? What, what causes that? How, do, how are you able to, to maintain that? So, so that's a function of the new technology that comes off, okay. the way you can monitor what's happening in your boiler, the more the, the predictive tools. There wasn't this technology available, and it will actually get greater and bigger. As, as AI develops, you may have a, a, a program that will be able to tell you exactly what's wrong in your boiler and tell you exactly what to do, and it will actually do everything for you. We're still evolving that, but at the moment, we've got um, programs that can tell you um, – why is your boiler unoptimized? Why is your efficiency uh, poor? We, we get this all from our technology partners. So mm. I think those are the things that, that we bring to the table. So what else do we do in terms of decarbonization? If you yeah. can't get rid of coal, one of the big things is about emissions. That's the biggest problem. We're one of the biggest polluters in the world. And uh, one of the things I used to say previously in interviews as well is it, it's very difficult for, for first world countries to force developing countries like South Africa to say, well, you know, you must stop using coal now, where these first world countries have used coal to build their economy and right. drive the road. It mm-hmm. is now our, our turn to do that, but and we must be allowed to do that, but we must also learn from the mistakes in the first world country where there was no uh, emission abatement measures put in place. Now we know mm-hmm. that we can reduce uh, SO2 by putting a flue gas desulfurization plant that removes SO2. We can put in low NOx burners that reduce uh, uh, the NOx. Now, for example, we've worked in the petrochemical industry where we've implemented low NOx burners and we've reduced it substantially below the legislative limit. So we've demonstrated that capability as backdrop into to engineering. Um, then there's also the issue of particulate emissions, the ash. So yeah. we work with our technology partners to actually help reduce those emissions. So that's what we bring in terms of the table, in terms of I wouldn't say total decarbonization, 
but in terms of what term clean coal power. In yeah. terms of, of uh, reducing the carbon output, we're also looking at uh, renewables. I think the big game changer is gas. So we also have the ability together with our technology partners to actually convert coal-fired power stations to gas-fired, which has got a lower carbon footprint gas than what coal, coal has. At the same time, we're looking at uh, converting coal-fired power stations into biomass. So that's something where you reduce the carbon footprint as well. The yeah. other big issue is obviously battery, uh, battery energy storage systems, commonly referred to as BES, uh, battery energy storage systems. So batteries also play a big role. So I think there's a whole mixture. There's a lot we can do as, as OEMs that, that bring this, but it's a matter mm. of decision making for, from the clients to actually say, um, this is what we want and this is how we want to work together with you to do it. Mm. So, so a, a, a decarbonized future rail or at least decarbonization for the future has a lot to do with a different energy mix to what we currently have and, and implementing all of these solutions that now exist, which didn't five, 10 years ago. 100%. You, you, I'm glad you mentioned um, um, ESCOM, um, or at least the, you, we keep talking about power utilities without naming them. Um, and I want to um, mention ESCOM a little bit now um, because the industry is divided on OEMs and having been both on the ESCOM side and now within the OEM space, in your view, why are the mixed views on the contributions that OEMs bring and also working with them? So, yeah, it is it's a very divided topic. And uh, I can tell you that uh, there's a lot of opinions, but I think, you know, like you said, I've been on both sides. I when i when i was in working for the the power utility we believed i always went back to the oems when we had trouble or some issues because we realized that oems have the knowledge they have the capability and um they there's something that they can bring about that other other contractors cannot do now when when i'm here uh on the other side you know, one of the things you realize as well is that sometimes the OEMs have been underutilized. And what we're seeing more and more now is is a big issue of cost. And this was raised at the uh, webinar as well, is to say, you know, OEMs are expensive. And I think one of the big, big issues that's missing from the debate is, yes, um, OEMs may be uh, a bit uh, more, I wouldn't use the word expensive, but they come at a premium in terms of the work they do because of the value that we bring because of the international mm. expertise and the skills that we, we actually have. We develop our skills base where we retain a highly, script, highly uh, skilled people. And this is a base that we keep in our organization. So our overhead cost is sometimes actually much, much more than other smaller contractors. And this sometimes is not factored in. So there's a premium that you have to pay when you make use of OEMs. But in terms of from the long-term picture, your return on investment is much higher from a long-term okay. perspective. You may get short-term gains, but over the long-term, that key word you use, sustainability, is not yes. there. Okay, so, so, I, so, so a lot of what drives these mixed views is the initial call it capital outlay versus the long-term sustainability of what you get uh, for the initial investment. Yes. And that's a message you try to give at the webinar. There will be this initial capital outlay. I think that's where the big resistance comes in. It's about spending mm. money up front and getting the gains later. I think that's what the big hindrance is. Now, Deva, just to be a little bit more specific, what does Babcock and Tutugo Engineering bring to the table insofar as OEM services? One of the things that we, we, we do is we actually maintain the boilers. We can actually uh, repair the boiler tube leaks. Typically, you hear during load shedding, we've had these units off because of tube leaks, tube leaks, and tube leaks. That's a big issue. So we can actually help fix it, but at the same time, we can help actually have prevent it. So when a tube leak happens, we actually can go in your boiler, we can do inspections, and if we have time, we can pinpoint the areas where we think the next tube leak is going to happen. So that's in the preventative mode. But we also help to fix tube leaks up and we've developed a skill where we can do it much quicker and uh, I would dare to say much quicker than our competitors. 
but we also do it much more safely as well. Safety is a big component in our business. Um, nothing takes precedence above safety, not even production. No matter how much pressure from the client is, we always tell our people safety is the most paramount important thing. So that's basically the, the, the maintenance. We also bring to the table uh, long-term strategic studies where we look at your look at the plant, we term it life cycle, uh, life cycle studies where we, we basically tell you how you can extend the life of your station. Okay, So that's the second thing. The third thing is what we term as O&M maintenance contracts where we have the ability to place uh, qualified and experienced engineers on the power station. So when there's immediate problems, that there is uh, there's something that that uh, can be done. We actually uh, we place them on the site, so when the problem happens, there's less downtime to actually uh, trying to understand what's going on. When this person is there, they need to get involved with a customer together with the engineers. It's about a partnership that we're actually saying we need to do. So I, I think those those are the three key areas that we would bring. You mentioned other issues about innovation. We can also train people. We can train engineers. We have the expertise and we can impart our knowledge and training expertise as well. I also know that there are international partnerships that Babcock and Tutugo Engineering taps into to maintain its position within the OEM services space. Can you talk us through how these international partnerships help to keep Babcock on the cutting edge of OEM services? One of the issues about how you bring innovation and technology is partnering and forming strategic alliances with uh, companies. So we have uh, a lot of alliances. We, our, our, one of our big alliances is with a company called Babcock and Wilcox. That was, uh, there's a lot of Babcocks, by the way, but this was our original parent company. And there's a long story to say how all the different Babcocks evolved. So we have a strategic alliance. They're based in the United States with them. With, uh, they're based in the United States, so we have a strategic alliance with them where when we tender for stuff and where new technology is available, we basically partner with them and we basically uh, help um, set up uh, a project where we can help the clients sort their problems out, enhance their performance. Um, that's one example. We have a whole, lot, a whole lot of others. We had a technology day which we hosted in the end of January in uh, in um, uh South Africa, where we invited uh, Babcock and Wilcox, and we invited some of our other uh, suppliers. Uh, for example, we supply valves, and there's, there's a whole lot of partners that we have too too much to, to mm. mention. So we have a wide spread that we can bring to the table. So I think those are one of the things that 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 people also must is that it's not us alone as Babcock and Tuka Engineering that can develop this. So we besides. You know, uh, we have a, a, a local presence. Uh, we also a triple BE level one company. Plus, we bring that international component where we can bring all these international companies to the table as well. And I think that was a bit of an eye opener for us because a lot of our clients did not know that we had these capabilities. There was a lot of assumptions made. And I think uh, like the technology day we, day we had really opened up this whole concept about OEMs and having strategic partners. What are your thoughts on the viability of a concession model? And also, can you describe, first of all, how that would work and what your thoughts are? Yeah, there was something that uh, came out in the webinar that uh, I think a lot of people, I wouldn't say duck and dive, but they didn't give their opinion about that because it's a very contentious issue. Um, as everyone knows, that National Treasury engaged a consortium to investigate ESCOM's plant performance and basically saying that... Uh, the investigation would basically determine how ESCOM's plant would be restored back to its original state via OEMs. And then the question came about, so if the plant's restored, what then? What do you do? And the idea was to say that then there would be a concession model where someone else would operate the plant. So I think one of the big issues there that need to be debated as well is that There'll have to be a lot of discussions with organized labor because this would mean taking over ESCOM staff. A lot of people would see this as privatization, which is not the case. But it, it, it involves a whole lot of complex issues. And a lot of the questions we're asked is, would OEMs be considered in this concession uh, model? One of the things I can say is that um, us, us participating in some sort of concession is not in the 
business model of an OEM. That's not in our business. Mm-hmm. But it's not to say that we wouldn't consider that. I think basically you would you would look and say is that if some private entity would operate the plant but would contract the OEMs to help maintain it. So I think there's a lot of work that still needs to be done around these concession models and we are waiting to see how this will evolve with National Treasury um, obviously uh, making the reports available and what the recommendations were from this consortium. So it's a bit of an unknown territory. I, I spoke about it because I believe it's something that we should consider, but the manner in which it's going to be rolled out is something that we need to debate. So you've already mentioned a lot about the maintenance of plants, about new technology and about um, implementing innovation, finding the sort of best of breed and anything across the world to help um, power utilities, or at least in a power mix of the future. Now, in terms of one of the burning questions here is, can OEMs help to end load shedding? And if so, how? I'm rather blunt with this answer. Yes, <laughs> you can. You just got to involve us in engagement. I, I can't be more blunt and simple about that. If hmm. uh, I, you know, I, I said in, I said in the uh, webinar as well that you know all the OEMs should be get uh, all the chi- chief executives and executives should be uh, all called together in a room. And they should be read the riot act and they should be saying, what are you doing as OEMs to reduce load shading? And mm-hmm. they should, they should be asked, well, what can you bring to the table? How can you help us? It's about engagement. Sure. Okay? And I think that's the key issue. Uh, mm-hmm. we've already proven, we've got a proven track record as OEMs, as even as Backlog into took engineering, we've got a, a proven track record. So I don't think that's up for debate. I think what's also the stumbling, uh, block is the issue of costs, which keep on coming up. But all we're saying is engage us. And there's what we term, you always open to a negotiation about how we how we engage, what's the cost. But I think the first step is engagement. There's OEM sitting on the sideline. I just don't think that's that's right. It's it's about uh, uh, all, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's basically uh, all hands on deck. It's a call for action. And certainly ESCOM on their own cannot sort out load shedding. They need all the help they can. And OEMs amongst and among other suppliers are primed to help reduce load shedding. It's a matter of just engaging and getting down to actually sorting out and fixing the plot. Now, the final question, as we move towards this just energy transition that we keep talking about, what kind of future are we looking at as OEMs partner more with the power utility? So I go back to two points. One is that this just transition will be a very diverse energy mix. That's the first part. A just transition doesn't mean you just click your fingers and you uh, basically transition from coal to renewables. It's not going to happen. Okay. Primarily from a generation point, but also from a transmission point of view. The transmission system in the country needs it to change in order to accommodate the renewables, but that's a topic on its own. The second issue is, I think from a, uh, a just transition point of view is that, uh, I think that, and you know, it's very difficult to articulate. There's no policy in this country. There's no energy policy. That's one of the things we need to get in this country. And we're not, we're not the only one. I mean, in, 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 in first world countries like, uh, like America, they always talk about energy policy. I've not seen a coherent energy policy in a country like that as well. But in South Africa as well, there is no coherent energy policy in the country. I think that's one of the starting points in terms of how this just transition will evolve and how it will work. Um, so I, I think there's, there's definitely a role we have to transition, but it'll take time and you need all the role players. But I think the key issue is that you need decisions. And I think that's what it means. You need decision makers, people that make decisions and we need to, we need to get a move on. Time is running out and the longer we delay, the longer the plant performance deteriorates. The thing mm. that's going to carry us, uh, through is the existing plants. That's what's going to keep this economy afloat in this country. So you've got to fix up the existing plants. 
the plants and the energy mix that comes in later, like renewables, will take time to develop. But if you don't fix up what you have now, you, you, you're going to have a big problem. That's a great point to, to close on. I think that uh, maintenance policy and this collaborative, uh, collaborating rather than engaging OEMs and everybody around the table. Thank you so much uh, for making the time, Deva. That was a really great conversation. No, thank you very much, Mungeli. Thank you for the opportunity again.